This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Brett, Kevin, Paul Thiessen, and our new patrons, Donald, Michael, Antonio, and Saud. On this episode of DTNS, Threads becomes more Fediverse-y, Disney Plus raises prices, and Shannon Morris tells us all about the latest from Black Hat USA 2023. Mm. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, August 10th, 2023, from Studio Garaje. I'm Sarah Lane. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From Studio Colorado, I'm Shannon Morse. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Well, we've got quite a bit to talk about. We are excited to talk about Black Hat with you, Shannon, a little bit later in the show. But first, let's start with some quick hits. Instagram's Threads social network, obvious ex-competitor, has placed a new Fediverse-friendly feature, inter- interoperability with Mastodon. Now you might say, how does that work? Well, by placing links in a Threads account that you control, and also having a Mastodon account that you also control, the Mastodon account can show a link to your Threads profile with a check mark, indicating you're a verified owner of both accounts. Good news for Google Docs users who need to remotely sign documents. Google has moved the feature from alpha to beta. Access for individual Google Workspace users is rolling out over the next couple of weeks. If you're an enterprise admin, you'll need to request the feature through a form. If you're a free Google Docs user, no word yet on when or even if you'll get access to the feature. U.S. President Biden issued an executive order on Wednesday prohibiting U.S. citizens from investing in advanced semiconductor and quantum computing business in China. The order also requires investors to report to the U.S. government on direct investments in Chinese companies that make AI and other semiconductors. Good news for Google. Oh, I just just read that one. Let me read the one I'm supposed to read (laughs) here. (laughs) Amazon started scaling back its private label business last year after disappointing sales and also criticism from lawmakers. The Wall Street Journal sources say Amazon is now eliminating 27 of its 30 clothing brands, such as Larkin Row, Daily Ritual, and Good Threads. After Amazon sells off the remaining inventory, its own clothing division will be streamlined to Amazon Essentials, Amazon Collection, and Amazon Aware. Sources also say Amazon is dropping private label furniture. Autonomous sidewalk delivery robot startup Serve Robotics, which previously spun out of Uber's acquisition of Postmates, is going public. Now, you might have been familiar with something called Postmates X, which under the hood was Serve Robotics, delivering to Postmates customers in multiple uh, neighborhoods in the LA area in 2018 with a commercial service launch in 2020. The deal was completed this month and regulatory filings show it's a reverse merger with Patricia Acquisition Corp. Now, as of the merger closing, Uber holds a 16.2% stake in Serve and NVIDIA has an 11% stake. All right, Rob, let's talk about Disney. What's going on? Well, Disney has some bad news and some more bad news. The company announced Disney Plus lost 11.7 million subscribers in Q2, due in part to India losing IPL cricket broadcast. Disney Plus now has 150.1 million worldwide subscribers, but there's more that's going to make us feel some kind of way. Disney announced it will raise prices across its live streaming packages starting in October. And Disney CEO Bob Iger said the company plans to begin cracking down on password sharing in 2024. In potentially better news, Disney will expand its less expensive ad-supported package to Canada, the UK, France, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark starting in November 1st. So as of October 12th, Disney Plus Premium, um, that's the one with no ads, jumps from $11 to $14 a month for U.S. customers. Hulu without ads goes from $15 to $18 a month. And then the Disney Plus and Hulu standalone ad-supported tiers will both stay at $8 a month, and the bundle for those two will stay at 10 but the main thing is that the big ones get more expensive shannon what do you think about it i'm so disappointed 
I'm one of those people that has constantly had all of the streaming services. And honestly, I was going through them all just last night and looking at my watch list and going, hmm, which one of these should I cancel? Because all of them are raising their prices right now. And I'm not a big fan of watching ads. So I never really pay for the lower tier uh, options, which are ad supported, just because I don't want to waste time watching those advertisements. I can fully understand why there might be families with like smaller children who may not want to purchase the ad supported options for Disney Plus either. Like they might be more interested in doing password sharing so that they can get the non advertisement uh, tiers that do cost more, but then they could share it out to more people. So the fact that they are cracking down on the passwords and then they're raising the prices, I can just see a lot of negatives here. Well, Netflix uh, was in the news uh, quite recently for the exact same thing as far as uh, crackdown on password sharing. Um, and over the most recent quarter for Netflix, we're not talking about Disney, talking about Netflix, um, the company said, uh, yeah, I mean, some people canceled, but uh, by and large, we got a lot more signups which indicates that a lot of people who might have been password sharing with others said, you know what, it's time. I'll go ahead and sign up and give the company, you know, my money. Um, I would assume that Disney is thinking the same. Um, at the same time, you know, if you have declining uh, enrollment, so to speak, what do you do besides raise prices unless you're going to uh, make everybody who's, uh, you know, looking at uh, your public company numbers uh, disappointed? So I think an issue that streaming services are going to now have, I know for me, I've been I've been a cord cutter for several years now. And, it, you know, a big reason was, well, it's cool technology to be able to stream TV, uh, you know, to p basically any device with the screen. But another big reason I did it was because it was just simply less expensive. Now, with all of these price, you know, pr price hikes for literally every single one of these platforms, you're getting to the point to where cable companies are actually not looking unattractive any longer as far as what they charge you. So I think that it's, it's, it's a game that these companies are going to have to pay. We, you know, we, we, we need to be profitable. But we also can't put the prices up so much that our customers start dropping us and going back to traditional cable because cable is really, really inexpensive right now. Yeah, I was always sort of wondering, at what point do people start saying, you know, is cable really the worst idea in the world? Shannon, <laughs> you were talking about being a cord cutter and, you know, looking through mm -hmm. all the things that you pay for and, uh, you know, maybe deciding that you might drop something that isn't really, yeah. you know offering you the content that you know you feel is worth the money you know would going back to cable ever be an option uh, probably not for me, but one thing I have been looking into a lot more is the over the air live free streaming services like Pluto TV, like Plex. Uh, there's a lot of them out there and I've been using those a lot more often lately. And it, m much of it is just because it's one less decision that I have to make. I just go there and choose a channel and then it plays and I don't have to think about what show I'm watching. It just turns on a show and it's really nice. So in that sense, like there's a bit of that reminiscence of when I was younger and I watched a lot of cable TV, but well, there's and, a lot and less you're decision making there. what's being offered to you. Yeah. And you kind of go like, okay, great. It, and the content yeah, it works is really, really nicely. Good. It is, is really, really good. It's really good content on those uh, on those free platforms as well. I, I regularly watch Crackle and Pluto all the time. Yeah. Just because there's good shows on there. Pluto TV straight up has an entire channel dedicated to Sailor Moon. So like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think um, Disney, yeah, uh, the next quarter or two um, will probably be, uh, uh, it, will, uh, it will be enlightening um, as far mm -hmm. as uh, how things are going. And this is not just Disney Plus. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, all of the standalone um, cable alternative uh, networks um, are, are going through the same stuff. You might have a hit show and then maybe you have a good quarter, but it seems like most of them um, are, are experiencing the inevitable, oh yeah, well, they're not going to pay for everybody. So if they don't pay for us anymore, how do we get them back? 
Well, if you are wondering why urban drone delivery systems seem to be taking their sweet time arriving in your area, you aren't alone. Uh, I wonder the same thing. Um, where is my urban drone delivery? Tom recently got a chance to interview Zipline co-founder and CTO and platform architect Keenan Wyobeck to make sense of what is holding up widespread urban drone delivery that we've been promised. One of the things that has been frustrating to me to explain to people over the years uh, is that you will see a company talk about drone technology and drone delivery, and I've tried to remind people that there are companies doing it, not just Zipline, but Zipline was the first one that I was ever aware of, and have, you've been doing it for a long time. It has been largely rural. What does it take for zipline-like services to be more commonplace in urban locations? Because I feel like that's where people get hung up. They're like, sure, I guess they're doing it, but I don't see it in my neighborhood. Yeah, a oh, great question. You know, I, I think it comes down to two challenges. One challenge is the delivery experience. Can you deliver precisely enough that you know? I picture you're you know on a row house you know in Boston. Can you can you actually hit that back porch? I noticed I said back porch. We can talk about that later. But okay. can we deliver that back porch? Right, not easy. Uh, and then are you quiet enough that, that that this is actually acceptable? Right, the, this can't sound like a swarm of bees. I just <laughs> I can't say that often enough. It just it's. Uh, uh, and I, I, I describe that as a neighbor problem, right? We all hopefully have great relationships with our neighbors and like nobody wants to put up with your neighbor getting a swarm of bees all <laughs> on a regular basis, right? As they're getting deliveries from a drone. And, and so you got to, you have to solve the, you have to solve that, that delivery experience problem. But then you also have to solve a really interesting airspace integration problem. How do you fly, you know, safely and responsibly with all the other air traffic? And, and, and re really this, you know, the, the, we call platform two at Zipline, which is this new platform uh, we're working on at Zipline. Uh, this was the answer to this question. Our customers have been asking it for years. Can you deliver to homes? Can you deliver to in, 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 in urban metro areas? And our answer was, well, no, because our platform one, like I mentioned, the, this long range platform, it needs a couple parking spots to deliver it. And most homes don't have that. So why the back porch? Yeah, this is, I mean, this, this is, it's, it's security is a big thing for deliveries, right? You know, we obviously started in the healthcare space where, yeah, you just don't want, you know, prescriptions and whatnot in right. someone's mailbox or even on their front stoop. And you don't always want to have to be home and uh, not, so the security and the privacy of the back porch is really powerful. It's one of the, it's, it's one of the many reasons drone delivery is transformational, assuming you solve the noise. Right. The because precision. you're mo uh, most of delivery people are not going to walk around to your back porch or can't because you've got locked fences. Exactly. Or whatever, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so being able to walk out there in your in your slippers and get what you get what you want, the privacy of your backyard and not need to be home and stuff like that. It's sort of the, the ultimate solution to the porch pirate problem. And and uh, yeah, it's it, that's really powerful uh, for, for all kinds of deliveries. Do you think it's difficult enough to operate drone delivery that porch pirates would not be able to create their own drones with grappling hooks to come and try to steal <laughs> your packages? <laughs> I think it'd be extraordinarily challenging to yeah, do that. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, and I, you know. <laughs> I, I'm just imagining the kind of questions I could see in my chat room as, as this, <laughs> sure. this goes by. Um, what about folks who don't have a back porch? What about, about folks in apartment complexes or smaller buildings or, or things like that? Uh, is, is it just, well, we'll deliver to the front porch or we'll deliver to a doorway? How does that work? Yeah, so the common area is how I think about it, right? So depending where you are in the world, it, you know, this is can be a courtyard, it can be mm -hmm. a lot of places spot up on the roof where you know where you can hang out and have a barbecue, and there's a patio we can deliver to, uh, and so it's all about common areas. And one of the things that's nice about what what drone delivery versus other types of delivery is we're on time. So if we you know if you pick a window that's you know a minute or two to deliver, and we'll hit that window, so you don't have to be like waiting there, and you can just wander. You know, you when you, when your app says it's coming, it's actually coming then, and and you can step out to the to that common area and grab you grab your order. Let's talk a little bit about Platform 2 specifically. Um, yeah. How does that work? Walk me through, you know, loading the burrito or whatever on uh, till the person gets it uh, from their courtyard. Sure. So first of all, you have to kind of describe it because it's definitely not at least what we assumed we'd be building. We started this design process. And I don't think what anybody assumes you, you would solve this until you get into it. But uh, it's a two part system. OK, so the, there's the, the, the zip up high. That's the drone. Uh, and then there's this thing we call the droid, this lower down from the zip, uh, but the line. And the droid is is active, right? It has its own uh, its own fan, so it can fly itself, and its own sensor, so it can find the delivery spot. Is it a quadcopter, uh, or, or is it? 
something else. Yeah, it's it, it's tricky to describe. So I just I, I picture it as like kind of a toaster, okay. like an old fashioned toaster aesthetically, a very cute toaster with a little fan on the back. OK, um, so kind of like a cross between a toaster and like maybe a miniature fan boat. I, if, if I'm trying to bring this to life and it's tethered um, then. It's tethered. Exactly. Gotcha. So okay. the tether handles the literally the heavy lifting sure, the weight sure. of the delivery. Uh, and then the fans on the droid handle the basically the uh, any kind of gust that might hit it and things like that. So it can stay precise delivering that really tight spot you have on your porch or wherever we're delivering to. Um, and so. So, OK, so when it comes in, let's start, I'm going to go backwards uh, mm-hmm. through the story here. So when it's delivering, uh, the, you know, the zip will fly out and hover uh, over the delivery site and then. The, the droid will lower down on that line mm-hmm. uh, and the zip is way up high, like, you know, as high up as as like a, a football field is long. So it's way up there. So uh, I imagine that droid... helps with the noise then because it's farther oh. away. Oh, absolutely. It helps with the noise. It helps with general like kind of the we think of it as the UX of the experience. Mm-hmm. Like how does it feel that the, the, the drone that's capable of heavy lifting? It just it doesn't feel like it's in your yard at all. It feels like it's way up in the sky. Um and uh, it feels great and helps with the noise, helps with the overall safety challenges of, of the layered safety systems, uh, helps with lots of pieces of the design challenge. And uh, yeah, and so that droid lowers down, uh, it takes about 10 seconds or so, and, it, and it's got its fan, so it's flying as, as, and to get right precisely to the delivery site, drops the package, and then zoop, retracts back up, and then it flies on back. And so the way that when it gets loaded, so it flies into this dock. Um, the droid then lowers down. So it's in the dock is where it gets charging and, and things like that. And then it lowers the droid down from the zip again uh, uh, to an operator who then just you know, opens a lid, puts in the next order and, and sends it on its way. Well, if this is all exciting to you, it certainly is to me. You can hear the rest of Tom's interview with Keenan on the latest episode of A Word with Tom Merritt. It's a podcast. You can find out more at A Word with Tom Merritt. Thanks to everybody who became new patrons and increased their pledges. As of late, we were doing kind of a push for Molly Wood because we love Molly Wood. Because of your support, we can bring Molly on the show one Friday every other month. In fact, we have Molly coming on the show tomorrow. Yay! But to reach our goal of having a Molly on one Friday every month, we need more help. If you haven't already, if you feel like you can help, do consider supporting the show by visiting patreon.com slash DTNS. Today is the final day of the annual security conference known as Black Hat, where researchers report on security vulnerabilities found on online networks, software, communication tools, and connected devices. Shane, I know this is right up your wheelhouse, and you've complied, compiled a big list of what's going on. So um, which, what stands out to you? What should we be looking at? Yeah, there was a lot of exciting news, but there were three top stories that really stuck out to me this year. Um, One of them is super fun. Another one is kind of interesting and the other one's kind of scary. So researchers from the Technical (laughs) University, I know, right? (laughs) Trailer, teaser. Uh, Researchers from the Technical University of Berlin figured out how to jailbreak the infotainment system in Tesla's with only about $100 in tools. That's the part that I was like, wow, that's so cool. This can let you extract the encryption key used to authenticate the car on the Tesla service network and access features like seat heaters and the acceleration boost, which actually is a paid feature. So technically you could get that for free if you jailbroke your Tesla. The researchers used it for leet hacks like these, but this could also allow for more sensitive data snooping, like access to session cookies, Wi-Fi passwords, and more. So it is a vulnerability. It could allow somebody to do independent repairs or modifications as well. Now, this flaw was disclosed to Tesla, and Tesla has not fixed it yet, but they are aware and they are working on it. Uh, the second one is the one that's kind of like, ooh, that's a little spooky. The Intel and AMD CPUs. Uh, both of those brands had kind of exciting weekends at Black Hat. Google's security team found a bug in Intel CPUs that allows an attacker to access data stored by programs all your different programs in the system's memories, such as encryption keys, for example. So that's the scary part. Yeah. 
the team of researchers over at Comsec found the AMD issue. This one leaks data from Ryzen, Threadripper, and EPCY CPUs. So it's a pretty vast vulnerability that affects a lot of different CPUs. Both of these issues were disclosed to both of the brands, and they have fixed them with software updates. So if you have a motherboard in your computer and the CPUs, just look for firmware updates for those, and you'll be able to fix those and patch them on your own systems. And there were no in the wild attacks that have happened that either of those brands know of. So this was just a researched vulnerability. It looks like it has not been used in any kind of real world attacks. Now, the third one is all about radios, which kind of has a place in my heart because I'm a licensed ham radio operator, not currently practicing. Researchers at OODA, O-O-D-A, found that the Tetra, or the terrestrial trunked radio, which is used in Europe, uh, Europe for law enforcement, it's also used worldwide for like government agencies, for police, for prisons, emergency and military operations. Uh, turns out those can be leaking broadcasts. Yikes. But also, Tetra is used for industrial setups. So that includes things like encrypted data and voice commands for uh, ICSs like pipelines, like gas pipelines, freight trains, railways, electrical grids. So that includes multiple vulnerabilities that they disclosed in the cryptography that could allow for decryption of all sorts of different traffic, voice and data, being sent via this trunked radio protocol. Mitigation techniques were shared with the affected industries, so they will have to work on patching those. So those are my top three stories. I mean, it's a little scary, but I'm happy that we have this event happening every year where well, researchers can talk share about this it. information. Yeah, the more everybody is, is familiar and hopefully yeah. uh you know knows what to do i don't know rob i i i gotta say just because i know a lot of people who have teslas i was like ooh, tesla yeah. hat. <laughs> not great no. not so, great I, I am not an ev owner yet but i do know one of the things that i that, that i was not liking about just where things were seeming like they were going is that oh we're going to charge you per month for this thing that is already in the car that you apparently paid full, full price for. But now you have to have a subscription for your, you know, for your tush to be warm in, in the <laughs> cold months. And I, I remember reading about this hack a few weeks ago. And one of the hackers said the reason that they did this was because they didn't want to pay for heated seats. That, that was what led to them trying to figure out how they could get around this. So I'm just wondering, are, you know, are we going to get to a time to where people are actually going to be jailbreaking their cars. I mean, we, we already have heard of like Teslas that run on the road that you know, they, they were like damaged by water and people got the parts and literally built their own mm -hmm. Frankenstein car. So they're not really official Teslas, but are we going to yeah. see, you know, folks, you know, when these cars are used, are these the kind of things that owners are going to do? There's you'll take it to a third party shop and they actually will go in and hack your car to get you features that you ordinarily wouldn't have. I, I kind of love it because I'm I feel very, very similar opinions about jailbreaking your devices so that you have the availability of, um, you know, all of these paid features. I mean, if I had to pay extra for heated seats, I would go to a different brand. That's just how I think if it's available in the car, I want to be able to use it as well. Um, this isn't the first time we have seen Tesla jailbreaks or any kind of Tesla hacks happening at DEF CON or Black Hat. Um, Tesla is very very popular as one of the big um, one of the big events that happens during the weekend at um, like the car hacking village at DEFCON so it's not the first time that we've had something like this announced at Black Hat and I'm glad that we have you know these research researchers coming forward and kind of helping the jailbreak community so that we can do things like this yeah, I mean, I guess the the last uh, thing I wanted to ask you a little bit more about, Shannon, was uh, the radio frequencies, uh, uh, you yeah. know, and the possibility of them being hacked. You know, I think a lot of people say like AM, FM, AM radio, what right. else is going on here? But there is more to it. 
There is a ton more frequencies and a lot of different um, cryptography that goes into radio. Most of radio is not encrypted whatsoever. Like you can tune into whatever broadcast you want to. I could make a broadcast from my studio and it is not going to be encrypted. Like I don't have that. I'm lawfully, I could not do an encrypted broadcast because that's not what my ham license allows for. But when you have law enforcement, you have medical emergency response and everything like that, like they do have access to this terrestrial trunked radio system and apparently this these issues with the cryptography have been very widely known for a really long time uh, at least internally with all of these systems but it hasn't really been a consumer known fact until now so it's it's a good thing that this research paper is coming out and making this more known so that these industries know that yes these can be hacked and yes it's it's a problem especially if people could potentially hurt industrial control systems and like take Take down an electrical grid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good. That's a good uh, way, way to think about how these things <laughs> actually are quite uh, quite serious. Sounds uh, like the makings <laughs> of a movie. <laughs> It really, it really does. Yeah. I mean, we have the pipeline that went down back in 2021, 2022 on the East Coast. And this is kind of similar to that. Like, th- those are the kind of issues that you need to think about whenever we're talking about like ICSs and how those could be vulnerable. Well, while you're thinking about this, uh, you might also think about <laughs> the fact that you might want to just clean up your office room. Maybe you have a separate room. Maybe it's just part of your bedroom. Maybe it's part of your kitchen. We all, in the remote world that we all live in, uh, make the best of what we have. So if you want a computer setup that folds and tucks away when not in use, you might li- like Logitech's new laptop best stand designed to be exactly that. It's called the Casa pop-up desk. Comes with a wireless keyboard, trackpad. They all pack up together in a case that is designed to be stored away easily. And in fact, if you look at the, uh, the, the, what the company tells you, it's sort of like, it kind of looks like a book in a bookcase. The Casa pop-up desk is available in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. It's, uh, in, uh, off-white, rose and green graphite options um and it sells for 179 pounds sterling which is about 229 us dollars so shannon rod what do you think about you know putting away your i don't know work desk to the point that you want it to be invisible into a bookcase would you pay for this Nope. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love my okay. work desk. Yeah. It's so I like should. aesthetically pleasing. I have like cute plants and stuff up here. Like I don't want to put it away. Yeah, I like my desk so much <laughs> that I've actually got a desk here. And on the other side of the desk, there is another desk facing it. So I can go around there and do other desk related things. I like my desk. <laughs> Well, you know what? I mean, kudos to both of you for being like, no, I like this. My desk, I I would love to put this away and just not have this, you know, in the middle of my garage where I am right now. But that isn't always, you know, an option. I think that, I don't know, I guess this is probably marketed to people who are like, I'm going to be working from home for the foreseeable future. I yeah. don't really have an office. You know, I, I've, I, you know, I've, I've been sort of, you know, cobbling together whatever to make this happen. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to put this away? But honestly, I mean, if you're working like regular hours, let's yeah. let's say Monday through Friday, nine to five, are you putting that thing away every day? No, Mm-mm. no, <laughs> that's just more work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna be like, bye, bye, desk. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye, desk. I'm going to go in the living room now. (laughs) All right, Rob, let's talk about what we have in our mailbag today. So Patrick wrote in with a take on yesterday's conversation about YouTube no longer showing recommendations when watch history is turned off. And he says YouTube might be trying to get more people to turn on watch history by disabling the recommendations. Those people who have the watch history disabled now still get recommendations. If YouTube turns off recommendations, perhaps those users will turn it on, turn on watch history to get the recommendations back. I mean, I 
don't know that I would do that. Um, I, I, you know, uh, uh, Rob and Shannon, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I feel like the recommendations, okay, every now and then I'm like, mm, maybe I'll watch this. Oh, I actually like that. Thank you, YouTube. But otherwise, I don't know that this is moving the needle too much for me. I, I click on them every now and again. Mm-hmm. But if they weren't there, I don't know that I would miss them enough to, oh, wow, I need to go do some things to make the recommendations come back. That, that's that's just me and my watching habits. But I, I, I do, if I, when I think back, I do click on them every once in a while. So, you know, I, I kind of like them being there. So I've had a lot of conversations with YouTube employees at different events, and they have kind of explained the algorithm as the algorithm shouldn't be thought of as the algorithm. The other algorithm should be thought of as your audience, other people. So how are you uploading these videos to other people? And how are people being recommended your content as your audience? And the fact that they are using, well, it sounds like they're using Watch History to recommend you know, mm-hmm. specific mm-hmm. videos to you. And for me, that makes sense as a viewer and a YouTuber. So personally, like this does not affect me. The fact that they're saying like, hey, you need watch history turned on to be able to see recommendations like that just it makes sense. <laughs> I don't know if I'm is if it's just me, that's just like, yeah, that's not a problem in, in terms of me. You. But yeah, but I mean, it's like, how else will they know what to recommend to me? Yeah, I'm like, welcome to the welcome to YouTube. Like, this is how it's been working for years. Um, right. The only time I can see this being an issue is if you have like a team account, because then if if other people are seeing your watch history, that might be kind of cringe, because a lot of it is very based on personal opinion and things sure. like that Cringe so or at least you know irrelevant you might not want to see that watch history but exactly. if you're using a team account to figure out like who are your competitors in the market or anything like that then yeah you might want to see that watch or you might want to see those recommendations so that's one way where i could see people saying like i don't like this but just for like a personal account this does not bother me well shannon morse um you always have Really good, really, really good thoughts on all the things Thanks. that we bring to the DTNS table. Uh, thank <laughs> you for being with us today. And also let folks know where they can keep up with the rest of your work. YouTube.com slash Shannon Morse, just like my name is spelled. Uh, I recently uploaded a couple of Pixel Fold videos. I have a Z Fold 5 in hand. If you're watching the video, I have that in hand right now. And I'm about to go pick up my Z Flip 5 as well. So I have a ton of foldables coming up on the channel. Definitely keep an eye out for those reviews, the comparisons, the camera recommendations, all that good stuff. Well, patrons, 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 you know who you are. Stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We're going to be talking more about YouTube, making changes. YouTube has been very busy lately, this time designed to fight spam. But just a reminder, DTNS is live Monday through Friday. You can catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Molly Wood joining us. We're so happy to have Molly Freddies. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>